Good morning, everybody. So uh, there's a few people in the audience know me. Uh, there's a lot of people who don't know me. Um, and my background that you've just been heard about, I feel sort of privileged to be here because I'm a bit of a latecomer to uh, IT for IT and the Open Group, in all honesty. Um, first uh, found out a little bit more about you guys and started really thinking about you with people like Eric and uh, Georg's in the audience somewhere and Lars who started talking to me about uh, the open group and IT for IT a few years ago. So I'm a bit of a late comer to it but I actually love some of the stuff that you've got and I'm going to talk a little bit about this and actually explain how we can start talking value. Uh, let's see if the clicker will move for me. So quick introduction we've already done. Um, you, we're going to talk a little bit more about using IT for IT to deliver business value and how it can improve the communications. And I'm going to say some very personal things here and share some stuff. I've actually been sat in front of CIOs in the last few weeks, uh, in the last few months, and I, I'm going to share some of the experiences that I've had around using IT for IT and the conversations that it can open and the conversations that it can close because it can close this. If anybody follows me on Twitter, by the way, I've been accused of tweeting rather a lot, you'll know that last week I was in Australia. I was in Australia talking IT for IT, and I was talking IT for IT and value, which is a really important thing. Excuse me, let's just jump past this one. So let's start talking about some interesting things for me to say with an audience like this. Architecture is boring. Right, I'll go now, so. so. <laughs> Architecture is boring. CIO, only a couple of weeks ago to me, when I started talking architecture to them, the first thing they did was switch off. Straight away. I lost the conversation. I hadn't got the ability to take that CIO down a journey and explain them uh, more about IT for IT just because I zoomed in on architecture. So there's a lesson for us to learn straight away. Architecture on its own, as much as we know how important it is, and as much as it's you know, so critical for us going forward, on its own, start a conversation with architecture, you fail. You don't take the conversation to the next level. You may take the conversation to the next level if you're talking to another architect or somebody who's actually interested in it, but if you want to talk to a CIO or if you want to talk to the business, you fail, simple as that. Speaking to a global head of operations, it's an honest answer that he said, I only worry about the architecture when something goes wrong. When everything's working, it's transparent, which actually is a really, really good message about architecture. And it's actually a really good message for saying this is why it's so important for us. Because when things are going right, you don't even need to know about it. You only worry about it when it's going wrong. When I was talking to the, um, the global financial services, I think this was an interesting one. I don't think I have time to think architecture. My business is running too fast, which is giving you a feeling now of today and the situations that a lot of our organisations, a lot of our businesses, a lot of people are in that situation. The world is moving too fast for them. Formality and structure, they suddenly feel is difficult for them to get a hold of because they've got to do, move very, very fast. DevOps is a classic example, and when people say, oh, we've got to go to DevOps, we can, we can throw away all these controls, and actually the best DevOps organizations have got more controls and structure than any of our old-fashioned organizations that were doing waterfall have had. But people don't realize that at first because they're all in this speeds everything. We've got to keep moving faster. So architecture seems, oh, it's hard, it's laborious, you know, wow, how can I do this? And this was actually a personal friend of mine who was, um, um, actually I'll name him because he, he said it, Mark Hall, a guy from Aviva, who was talking to me and saying, cloud, DevOps, I am security, you name it, I have to do all of that. Where'd you magic up the time to fit in these additional things that we're talking about? Now, Interestingly, I said I'll share some personal things with you. When Eric, four years ago, said to me, um, we need to start talking about ERP for IT and IT for IT, and we start talking about value chains, and he mentioned the open group, that was my honest reaction. Oh no, it's going to be Togaf, and I don't understand Togaf people. They all talk a language which I don't really quite understand. And I know it's really, really important, but I don't quite get it. So that's telling us something as well. This is probably the least important thing in the corner. Uh, actually, this is being recorded, isn't it? This is the most important thing in the corner, 
um, uh, which I really think is very, very important. When my partner, uh, Mandy, said to me, who cares about plumbing? Because I've been doing a lot of work in the house and getting the plumbing correct, spending a lot of money on things, changing all my lights, putting LEDs in, and the curtains are the most important thing. And actually, what really, really frustrated me was I was going, oh, the curtain's the most important thing. And everybody who's come into our house since has commented on how wonderful the curtains look, making me feel really, really stupid because I was the guy going, oh, curtains are important. What am I trying to get across to you there? What I'm trying to get across to you there is value. All of these things, without a value conversation, you'll see this every single day. So, just give you some negatives. I've gone very public on saying, I think IT for IT is brilliant. I think IT for IT is the missing link. I think you have got the keys to the kingdom. I have put my career on IT for IT now. I do nothing else. So when we did the introduction, I run a business now which is only IT for IT. Don't do anything else, just IT for IT. I love it. I think it's fantastic. I think you've got something which is so special that I, it would make me want to do that. Why? I can now go and talk value to everybody I speak to. I can open up a conversation. I can start talking about value chains. People love the concept of IT as, an, uh, IT as a value chain. I can actually break it down into value streams and I can use the words value very, very strong and give examples with it. We're going to give some examples in a while. We're going to give you some real life examples of value. That for me opens doors. I can talk to CIOs, I can talk to CEOs, I can talk to the business. When you talk value, people listen. When you don't talk value, they switch off. When you talk value, they might challenge what you're saying around value and challenge why you're saying this, but they listen to you because value is valuable. And it's as simple as that. You have got something absolutely wonderful. Thank you, you've given me a missing link. A missing link which has made me go really excited. A missing, li missing link which in the last 12 months has literally taken me around the globe, um, <laughs> hence being in Australia last week. Uh, literally taken me around the globe, talking to people about this because now I can change a conversation. A missing link which has stopped me talking about solutions and technology which may sound quite unusual working for Hewlett Packard Enterprise. You might expect that that is my main theme to talk about technology, but actually it isn't. You know, technology on its own that doesn't deliver value, well, I don't want to be in that space and neither does our company. We want to be in a space where our technology or whatever we're using delivers value because if it delivers value, people use it more, they use it more, they get more out of it and they want to use more again. And of course, I can speak the language of the business. I might be preaching to the converted here, but what I'm trying to very subtly say is, stop talking architecture, think about that throughout the rest of this event, start talking value, you have got something amazingly special. Very, very different that I get quite excited about it. And I'm prepared to stand up in front of people like yourselves and say, architecture's boring, but actually you've got something wonderful. So please sort of keep that in mind and capture that. Now, let's think about value. Well, let's think about value very differently. I'm sure you've all seen this uh, sort of slides about the different generations. If you think about what's valuable to a baby boomer compared with somebody in Generation Z, value is very, very different. So the first thing is just thinking value is one thing which everybody accepts. That's not a, a good way to think about value. Why? My mother is pretty good with a PC, uh, but quite slow. And when things change, she really, really doesn't like it. My son uses IT in a way I can't even keep up with him. And I've spent my entire career in IT. He's downloading stuff, he's using stuff, he's using different mobiles, everything to him is mobile already. We don't have this concept in his world of mobility. His world is mobility, that's what he uses. He gets stuff, he throws it away and everything. So to him, what's valuable is very different to what's valuable to my mother. My mother likes stability. She likes things really sort of stable, fairly slow. She doesn't like fast change. My son wants absolute instantaneous change, constant change. It batters him and he loves it. The more it changes, the better. So we, we can see across the generations, we have different versions, or sorry, different views of value. 
Now that's important for us because actually in our industry now, all these people are in our industry. People have been talking about Generation Z is going to you know, change our industry. There are already 16 year old millionaires that were born obviously in Generation Z. 16 year old millionaires that are running their own businesses and doing things differently. So our world is changing really, really fast and we've got to cater for all of them. So the way we present and think about value, you've got to think about the audience. Now, uh, I think I stole this slide, actually, I, and I apologise because I can't remember where I stole it from, so, especially because I'm being recorded. Um, value is only valuable when its value is valued. Mm, that's a profound statement, isn't it? So, value to my son, I'm going to make it cheaper, well, he's not really that interested in making it cheaper because that value isn't valuable to him. Making it cheaper is, I don't really care. If it's expensive and it does the job and I can make millions out of it, who cares? You know, value to my mum, if I can make it cheaper, is really important to her. Now, what we tend to see is a grouping, really, now of values. Not everything applies to everybody, but better, faster, cheaper, safer are sort of high-level groupings where we see value now. In a lot of organisations where people like to think about those things. But don't blindly think that every single one applies to everybody, because they don't. But better, faster, cheaper, safer generically seems to work with a lot of organisations and where you can focus value down and actually win friends and influence, basically. Now, on that point, I'm going to hand over to Eric to explain some bits and we're going to do a bit of a double act here now. So I'll pass over to Eric. Cheers. So more than ever, IT is in a sort of a numbers game. And obviously when you see a slide like this, you don't know what number to fully focus at. But the essential message of this slide is, you know, it is going to be more and it needs to be faster and you better get it right. If you zoom in on the middle bar, you see on the left hand side, you know, the number of applications people are expecting to grow ourselves into by 2020, give and take a couple. But also then the number of applications that how much it's increasing compared to today, which is a 30 fold, and again, give and take. It's not about the exact number, it's more like the trend, the numbers behind the numbers that are saying. And also looking at the number of releases per year by application, more than 25. So you can really see that you know, the time it takes to actually release applications, not just the mobile app, but all things that come to actually to support that, are always being improved. But here's the catch. On average, we only get around about 33% right. And that's okay, because it's very hard to get things right. You know, you rather basically take more an agile approach and fail fast and get over it. But 43% actually shows you that we have to basically be going much better in understanding, okay, how do we deliver the value that Tony so much highlighted um, to the consumers? Because the younger the generations are, the more they're inclined to just throw things away. It's for older people that basically are like saying, ah, oh, I know this is hard stuff, you know, because I know the complexity behind it, so I'm willing to sort of have some lenience towards things not quite working as I want them to do. The younger people are, they just expect things to work. They have no appreciation for the complexity, and therefore it just either works or it doesn't work. And if it doesn't work, they just throw it away. On average, the first impression is already met after three seconds. But what is even more interesting, now we're all living in a social connected world, Happy people tell around about nine other individuals how happy they are with the consumer experience. This is a great app. I love the service this company is providing me with. And also, of course, by the way, we don't talk to people anymore. We talk to our phones. So it's not that you have anything else to talk about. It's basically you talk to the app. So the app really is the representation of the company. If things go well, you're doing a good job. You're retaining customers. But when things go wrong, around about 22 people are being informed about the fact how bad the consumer experience is. People love to talk more about things that don't work, that actually do work. So the net net of this story is that we have to find other ways to get ourselves organized in IT. Because obviously IT has always been part of the business, sometimes deep down in the trenches of the organization, and now we have this new thing, it's called the digital enterprise, and all of a sudden IT is hot and new anymore because you know, so much products physical products are getting instrumented with software. So it's really becoming the business instead of part of the business. So in essence, basically, better, faster, cheaper, safer is a key message that basically rings through all. The way we organize IT needs to fundamentally change. And why is that? Because people are not willing to pay for things anymore that don't, they don't use. 
So the, actually the volume of the, comp the complexity, the thing I want, is just the thing I want. And I only want to pay for the thing I want and nothing else. And the real interesting thing is that this is not sort of limited to your best competitor inside the industry vertical. No, it's best across every industry. Consumer experience is consumer experience. And because we're living in a digital world, all our phones are loaded with all kinds of apps across different industries. And the best app is sort of setting the benchmark for all the others. So that is why it's all disruptive. Because a, an online game could set a standard for a bank. And that's the hard thing about it. It's not that you sort of can compare yourself against your industry peers. It is basically comparing, competing against a completely different industry. So that's why it's basically impacting basically all of us, how things work. So you get what you're given to what you get what you want, plus you didn't know you needed. How many times do you actually get other people also use this when you procure something? So the intelligence in the applications, knowing who you are and what you want, what you purchase and how it relates to other things, so the whole big data instrumentation, again, we're just used to that idea. And more and more we actually want to have that augmented reality to support us in our daily lives because we're too busy with the other stuff. So like I said, the bar is rising and it doesn't really matter anymore what generation you are. My mother-in-law is basically teaching 80 year people old to communicate with their grandchildren using iPads. So it is Generation Z is still there, and the baby boomers are still there. But again, also the generations are cross-pollinating. That's how great technology is. So in other words, there is no boundary to this. It will get bigger, it will get better, but how do we get organized? So when we look basically at how IT organizations have evolved over time, it's basically we were a hardcore engineer to order type organization. We could make anything the customer wanted, the line of business wanted, as long as basically they basically keep the budget flowing and we can make them anything they like. Which is great, because basically God has basically started. That's how IT started. It was a hardcore, deep down technology thing. It's hard to do IT. We evolved basically because the one thing that's great about an engineer to order model is also its sort of biggest shortcoming. It takes a while before things get done. It's also, if you look at the organizational style, it is plan, started the project, moving things into development, and then throwing it over the high wall into operations. We have all heard that, basically, how siloed IT is. So basically, IT came up with a new way of working, industrialized IT. We're going to create ourselves some more common services to make life better for everybody, really. Most of the industrialization, common services, common basically either platforms, databases, sometimes applications, were created, but they were created for one selfish reason, to get rid of that, you know, you're too slow, it's too little, too late, and basically here is things you can consume. But the consumers in mind were more like IT people than anybody else. So what is new and different about the right-hand model is that basically it is much more consumer-oriented. We call that basically IT for the digital enterprise or digital IT, or whatever buzzword you want to associate with it. But there are some fundamental shifts in the right-hand model. You can see in the middle we still talk about plan, so, uh, build, deliver, run, which is at least good because it added, like the IT value chain did, uh, a new value stream in the middle. But what is actually the poor part about it, it's very technology-centric. On the right-hand side, you're consumer-centric. You do anything you do, taking your end consumer into account. The people that really would consume the services of the line of business and nothing else. So this is much more than just a technology shift, it's a cultural shift. It is taking the consumer as your starting point and then looking back into your IT value chain, whatever needs to be tweaked and twisted to make sure these consumers get what they needed. So this affects culture, this affects basically finance, it affects basically what you build, the technology, it affects basically all you do. So IT is fundamentally shifting in all the dimensions you can imagine. That's why it's so transformational. And that's why we're all running these projects. And Tony already mentioned, you know, when we met with uh, uh, Mark Hall, is that, you know, I'm doing DevOps, I'm doing cloud, I'm doing brokering, you know, I'm doing all this stuff, so why would I care? Well, because all those initiatives are the new silos. You pretend that DevOps is at least, well, it's related to cloud, but cloud is a separate initiative. And then service brokering is another separate initiative. And then, by the way, I'm managing my core, and that's another separate initiative. And we basically said, no, no, you have to really look at the, um, how the IT value chain, you're affecting the same people. It's the same set of activities. How many value chains are there when it comes to the architectural side of it? It is only one. So to a large extent, the things are basically being done by the same people. So we basically looked at this, and as you look back at enterprise, using a value chain lens. Holistically, 
you are consumer centric. Anything you do takes a consumer at the, in the first point, uh, starting point. You are agile when you're creating new stuff. You want to fail fast and improve iteratively. You are multi-sourcing because you only want to focus on things that are unique to you and then you basically source commodity, which brings you speed and quality at the same time. You can't sort of forget about your core IT. It's still there because we can pretend that the mainframes are, are gone, but they're still there in the background. When I'm booking my online application or online my flights, um, we all know that basically in the background, the mainframe is still basically doing the actual scheduling. Security goes without saying, because if you can be faster, you are consumer centric, but if basically people's personal information is on the floor, you know, your reputation is gone before you know it, especially given the network effect. So in other words, all these things, are crucial functions, qualities, requirements for how you run and optimize your IT value chain. And it will affect your culture, your people, your process and technology to become faster, better, cheaper, safer. So the question is, okay, how do you basically get going? How do you get smarter about that? Well, the foundation of it is the IT for IT. It's all grounded in IT for IT. The key message is there. And we all basically have lived through different iterations of getting it. Last year, this time, we basically announced the standard to be emerging, which in the end got emerged or got launched in, in Edinburgh. So we all know this story. And if you don't know it yet, this is the ultimate experience basically for you to actually start learning about this. It is really grounded in it. What I think is also a great observation is that you can see that you know, IT for IT was built by architects. Because the thing, what I think is the most important part is hidden all the way down at the bottom on the right hand picture, which is basically the value chain itself, the service backbone. Because that is the one thing that really highlights and articulates that, you know, from wild idea into a charter project, into something that got into the catalog, that got consumed, basically that's the thing that's all, it's, that everybody cares about. That is really what you want to focus on. And the rest is just a means to an end to get that service out there. But that's just the foundation. When we looked at other industries, and there is so much we can learn, because in IT we pretend that it's all so unique and different. We are all different in IT and we really would like to have different words, but there's so much else we can learn from other much more mature industries in the way we organize IT. The way we look at it, basically there are three roles that IT organizations typically play in conjunction. And we can quickly go through this. On the one hand, you are basically acting as like the broker. In other words, you take pride in getting someone else's work and putting it into your catalog and make it available like it is your own. This applies to house brokering, mortgage brokering, stock brokering, as well as to IT brokering. It's just getting someone else's service, put it in there into your catalog, and just act as a single stop shop, both for request fulfillment as well as for IT operations. But then someone else needs to do the dirty work which typically is where the system integrator comes into play, or the service integrator comes into play, which basically assembles different individual components, mature components, into something that is a composite that is really value-added and differentiating. So the service integrator doesn't want to be building commodity. It wants to basically get something that's unique and different. So then someone else, again, needs to basically build the more commoditized components, infrastructure services, platform services, etc. In, in today's IT world. And each of those roles are optimized for different KPIs. And this is not new. This is nothing more than basically three value chains because each of them are a value chain in their own right, but they're wired up like a value network. They're wired up in a value network across different legal entities, but also, I would argue, most IT departments, shared service IT centers, are actually fulfilling all these roles at the same time. But if you compare this picture towards the one we saw in the beginning, which was plan, build, run, you can see how profound the shift is from a very much project-centric organization to an organization that is truly service-centric, fulfilling three roles in conjunction, using the same technology foundation underneath that. Because you don't want to have three technology stacks implemented to support three roles. That's why this is hard. And that was basically what we get back as well. Two weeks ago, I was basically in Washington. Four weeks ago, I was in France. Last week, I was basically in the back in the Netherlands, talking with customers, okay, I love the big picture. It's too much all at the same time. And we basically said, okay, how can we improve from that? So by taking an agile approach. And I'm not talking about, you know, all the fancy part of agile, but the fundamentals. Agile, scrumming, means that you're focusing on those user stories that add most value now. Waitest, shortest job first. The thing that now impacts my line of business most is the one thing I'm going to work upon. So if you combine, on the one hand, the big picture that you have, the blueprint, 
supported by software tools and model offices, all the things we've heard before. And on the other hand, I mix it up with the best of Agile, which in other words, try analyzing where your value chain is broken, depending on whether you're the broker, the integrator, or the supplier. That gives you, okay, where are you gonna fix it? By putting on that holistic lens. And the combination is where the magic happens. So let's talk about some real examples and bring back Tony on stage. Thank you, Eric. Um, so a few things that Eric said that I'm going to jump into before we just get into this example. Do you know, um, I, ha I hear IT people say this constantly, you know, it's really quite complex IT, it's really quite difficult. It, it, yeah, it, so was building buildings like this, so was building, you know, uh, the Great Wall of China, and so was building lots of things like that. You know, life's difficult, tough, live with it, get on with it. You know, there's no point whinging about it, there's no point keep complaining about it. The important point which Eric just finished on is dropping value fast and regular. That's the world we live in now. People want things. They don't want us to keep saying it's hard, it's difficult, it's complex. Tough, just live with it. Get on, make it easy for people. If you keep saying it's hard, it's complex, it's difficult, you know, you sound quite boring. Um, because everything's hard, difficult and complex. That's the world we live in. Putting people on the moon is hard, difficult and complex. You know? So we have to think of this regular value conversation. And we, we mentioned uh, my friend Mark Hall a couple of times. And one of the things I think he's an expert at doing, by the way I should mention Mark, is, uh, he was the chairman of the ITSMF and um, he's been quite high profile in some of his jobs and things like that. He's fantastic at recognising this and delivering value back to his business. And his team do the same sort of thing in regular drops. Not necessarily an IT for IT organisation um, um, yet, <laughs> hopefully he will be, um, but that's something I've learned and seen him do uh, and, and it's interesting that in IT we're a bit slow at learning lessons. We really are quite good at tripping up over the things we should have really known about in the past. When uh, I was introduced, um, one of my back, part of my background is around ITIL and ITSMF and I was heavily involved with them. I've been heavily involved in ITIL since sort of the very, very early days. And one of the things that happened with ITIL is we created evangelists that became one in the perfect world of ITIL. How long has IT for IT uh, been in the industry? Oh, look at this case study. Real life example. True organization. Fantastic architecture. All based on IT for IT. You'd walk into that organization today and you'd think, wow, they're an IT for IT reference site. Fantastic. Roadmaps which are probably the best I've ever seen in the industry. The architects are absolutely um, beside themselves going, life's wonderful, we've got this reference architecture, we've got to fill it all out, we're gonna, we've got some bits missing and we're going to invest some more money here and we're going to have this perfect IT for IT landscape. And they're not seen as delivering any value and the business is really, really not very happy. Why? Fall into the same mistake as we did with ITIL. Evangelistic about IT for IT. They've forgotten the whole concept of value. Because without value, it's a waste of time. Eric said that point before. Let's think about incremental value on a regular basis. Let's not just think about populating an IT for IT architecture and the landscape. Let's think about what's hurting the business and the pain. And let's take those pains away. And let's really focus on the things that are important because that's what will keep that business engaged. Now, interesting as a real life example, it's difficult to stand it up and say, you know, already we've seen somebody doing this with IT for IT. We've mentioned certifications out. Please, industry, and I am being recorded, and please, industry, recognize certification is really important, but don't fall into the trap of doing what we did with ITIL and trying to get everybody qualified and having a world worth of people that are saying, well, on page four, chapter three, it says. No, no, don't fall into that trap. Let's think about certification so it adds value to us. Let's think about it so we use people who can actually be very valuable in, the, in our businesses, in our industry. Let's not go into a world of people getting badges and qualifications because we'll create organizations like this. And IT for IT then will fail because it'll just get a bad name because people will go, oh, it's another one of these standards. You can already see the doubters in the industry. Get on Facebook, get on Twitter, get on any social media. You can see people already saying, oh, it's just another framework. Yeah? And I'm the guy who's going, yeah, but I think it's brilliant. It's really, really different because I talk about it from value. This organization didn't. 
true story, really important one for us to learn. Do not fall into the traps. Remember what we've learned in this industry already and let's move on and use that uh, knowledge uh, and actually use it to our benefits. Another organisation, this global uh, um, finance, that just happens to be using IT for IT. And I love it. You go into this organisation, they're not talking IT for IT. In fact, hardly anybody speaks about IT for IT. It just happens to be based on IT for IT. Almost flippant, yes, yeah, based on IT for IT. What we're doing is we're looking at the business pain. So we're looking at things like mobile apps and getting out to the Generation Zs, new platforms, platforms using different types of media, platforms that get to them faster, uh, quicker, safer, better, platforms that they can try out that work for their type of uh, media that they're happy with at the moment, and they need to do them really, really quickly. So they've looked at use cases based around doing that. Then when you look at the use case based around providing that new mobile app, they look at the, the, the pain that they're addressing and the potential value it can deliver. In some cases, the value is really low because it's not that important. In some cases, it's really, really high. So then they can use an agile approach, as Eric's just been saying, to say, let's go for those high value things, things that's gonna have massive impact, but let's not do something which is gonna say, in nine months time, trust me, it's going to be wonderful because they're not going to engage. They want to see, in two weeks' time, you're delivering me some value. In three weeks' time, you're getting some more value. In seven weeks' time, I'm getting incremental value. They want that regular value drop, that agile approach to delivering value. And once you're regularly delivering value, guess what? The IT reputation improves, the business pain starts being removed, the customers start getting happier, and as Eric just said before, everything now is compared to the best app, and the app doesn't necessarily need to be the app that's you know, associated with that industry. It could be a gaming app, it could be a, a motor racing app, it could be anything. If you're seen then to be comparable to those things and they're seeing more value, they then start spreading the news and talking to people. And I'm, I'm absolutely stunned all the time the way this happens, especially with the Generation Z people, the way good news just, you know, just spreads around the world so fast because people like to see this. We, for too long, a lesson we need to learn from the past, have said, trust us, we're the IT experts. You'll get all the value at the end of the project. Yeah, hence why waterfall projects now are starting to get less and less common and people are getting less happy with them. So, one more for Eric. Yeah, well, the, um, Tony was saying, you know, good news spreads fast, but bad news spreads faster, and basically typically hits the news, and there was this case as well, that we had a global high-tech company that was sort of really suffering from a sort of a business continuity challenge, it really was all about operations. And at first glance, when we came in, basically felt like, you know, wow, these guys are really rocking it, you know, they've got all this automation in place, they have monitoring, and it was all nice and dandy. You know, what could be causing this? Why, why is this not working for us? So we basically, again, leveraged the, the IT value chain, in this case, the detect the correct value stream, and basically did some root cause analysis to how to identify that in despite all the good efforts and automating and monitoring, they were forgot to basically to get the C and the B in place. So the one thing that matters most, I think, when we go to the purple line at the bottom of the reference architecture, the surface, wasn't as well captured in the C and the B, so that basically topology-based event population was a challenge, and that basically caused the fact that you know things were going out and people had a hard time finding basically the root cause. So despite on the one hand that you can be high-tech electronics, you can be basically state of art in the industry, some of the foundations are there. So even the checks and balances that IT for IT gives us, the basics, when you go back to the idle background, uh, IT for IT can help with. They basically yes, put a plan in place, they actually do their own roadmap, an eight-month incremental roadmap, not just to fix the scene to be, which we all know is one of the challenging topics, but also then to understand that this is not just about operations, it's about the whole value chain coming to life. So this customer actually did a roadmap from D to C to R to F to R to D to S to P, really to clean up the whole value chain and make sure that shit basically doesn't end up in operations um, and that in the end reduced waste so fundamentally um, 
even though high tech is there, um, go back to the checks and balances. And again, IT for IT and the reference architecture really does a great job of really getting things back to all right. What is it really that we have done? And take away all the veneer and all the fine lining, go back to the root cause and use it as a way to instrument. And when you do that well, you know, customers really love it. And I think there is one takeaway from this slide is that this is the only language the business is willing to invest in. Help me to improve my uptime, reduce the number of security events, make sure that I've got fewer people basically focusing on mundane stuff so I, they can actually do more value-added activities. And million dollar savings on business efficiency, and I don't mean the efficiency inside IT, it is basically re removing waste for line of business people dealing with IT. Um, those kind of things really help 45% um, support cost reduction uh, because you're not doing things anymore that people didn't care about. Basic portfolio management. We have grown a library of stuff that basically sits in the catalog and that people might not be looking at it. So between S2P and R2F, analyzing what is in your portfolio, is it being used, and if not, just take it out, is a massive improvement. And interestingly, what you're seeing on these, these are real life examples. These are not made up, real life examples, actual things that we've pulled from clients at the moment that we're working with. Some of them I don't actually like. Some of them I look at them and think, yeah, they're still too IT. You know, I can go and speak to somebody about you know, the business when we're talking about million dollars efficiency for the business, I really love that one. Some of the IT ones actually are still focused too much on IT, but we're learning. And actually, IT for IT has enabled us to deliver that. And as you can say, real life examples, and we've got all the value streams covered there. So that I can change conversations. Execs listen to me when I speak to that language, whether they be a business exec or whether they be an IT exec. So, we'll flip to the next slide. so last slide. We said we're going to stop talking uh, architecture, start talking value. The lessons out of this, whatever generation, they all want value. The way you contextualize value for those individuals is key. Don't think value is just a generic way that you're going to uh, present this to everybody. So think about your audience that you're presenting value to. And remember, everybody wants to see value very regularly. And if we start going down an IT for IT approach, which means 12, 18 months down the line, you'll see some value, forget it, you're doing it wrong. You need to be showing value fast. So you could attack things from a simple value stream perspective. You could att attack things from a pain to the business perspective. You could attack things in whatever fits the organizations that you work in. But the beauty of it for me is I can bring it all back to IT for IT. This is why I think IT for IT is brilliant, because then I can say, and behind all of this is a vendor neutral reference architecture. Oh, I brought that architecture word in. But now I can bring that word in with confidence, strength. You have created something brilliant. Thank you very much. I wouldn't mind taking a seat just for a, a few questions. Um, I did see some coming in um, around here and um, to ask the questions today is the uh, Open Group uh, VP of Standards and Certification, Andrew Josie. So, Okay. But don't blame him on. for the content of them. <laughs> Is the mic on okay? Okay, good, thank you. Well, thanks for Tony and Eric for uh, taking us through uh, introduction there. Um, in fact, uh, I think the questions have been listening to you there all about uh, stop talking about architecture and talk about value. So let's, uh, first one here. How do you see IT for IT helping organizations provide better quality services and products to users? Okay. Um, I think, but like I said in my, in my slide, the, the, the thing that I think is most profound about IT for IT and the reference architecture is the fact that it's really centered around the service itself. And that's the architectural side of things. But when you actually introduce that line to a customer and help them realize that everybody in the same organization is really supporting that, uh, that the creation and realization and maintenance of that particular service, in the end it opens eyes. People don't in their day-to-day -day work don't, don't realize that, that they're all part of that same thing. If you contextualize it in what the line of business does, very basically talking with people on the help desk, what do you do? I close tickets. Really? 
well, no, I actually improved the uh, availability of a service better, the KPIs. What do you really do? Well, if you're for a bank, you help basically to make payment transactions occur. Or if you're an insurance company, you actually help policies to be processed. And that whole conversation is why people are starting to change differently, to think differently about IT for IT and to think differently about that job. It's about the end result more than anything else. And the architecture makes, gives you a language to have that conversation. I think the other thing I've seen, particularly around products, is the whole concept of systemic waste, where people say, you know, I'm going to have the best incident management on the planet. Why? What's the point when the rest of your value stream is broken? And when I start having conversations with people like that, it changes the whole products and tooling conversations as well, uh, and makes people think slightly differently. I interesting, one thing that I, I think IT for IT is doing for us from a, from a pure product perspective, is people now have started to realize dependency and risk as well. So you, you, you would expect vendors like ourselves to say, we've got one product that does it all. Well, that would be a really stupid thing to do, wouldn't it? Because then you'd just take over all that risk to your organization. So I think it's making people think differently as well around products on that perspective. So these are, there's some really good things that are coming out of it there. Okay, I think this one is uh, sort of more of the same here. Can you say something about quantifying the value of the IT for IT approach? How do you quantify it? You quantify it in whichever terms the consumer de desires that quantification. I know that's a very consultancy answer, but that's what you have to do. If you're working with a financial organization that everything is about finance, you quantify it in finance. If you're working with a defense organization that everything's about the warfighter, you, you quantify it in terms of the warfighter. If you work in a fast moving consumer industry in retail or something like that, where everything's cans of beans, you, know, you quantify it like that. But that's the way we need to get very good at doing things. And, and I think in general, we're not good at that in IT. Um, I think we're very good at using IT terms, and we're very good at talking about mean time between fails, mean time to repair, all them type of wonderful stuff, which means nothing to somebody who's selling cans of beans. Okay. Um, this was more of a te technical question, I think. Is the service catalogue the entry vehicle for human systems and machines to find value with this operating model? So again, the word value being raised. Wow. <laughs> You can have that one. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I would say definitely. I think one of the key things that I liked about IT for IT is they need the art of a value stream and then the service catalog as a key ingredient for that. Um, I definitely think that you know if we are able to package up things that people use in that service catalog and help them drive the consumption, it is really, sort of, I think, a good point to measure whether people are liking what you do. And I think that's the one thing that's having the service catalog per se, having a single place is just a starting point. The whole usage and the metering and as part of that is the more important part of that. And also to tie that directly back into strategy portfolio. So you basically go on a very active understanding of what people are actually liking what you did and not just at the shallow level first, which is okay, how many downloads do I get? But what do people actually think by instrumenting the actual services in, uh, to understand what do people do with your app? So it, it starts with the catalog, absolutely, because that drives you towards having services in there. It starts by me metering what people are consuming from your catalog, but ultimately, and I think by extension, not just the service catalog, but the application itself should know well, how people are using it, because that gives you the insight, are people liking what you got? And a bold statement, and it is a bold statement, I guarantee I can improve customer satisfaction by focusing on request to fulfill. I guarantee. So that's a different way of answering it. You get request to fulfill, working right, customer satisfaction always goes up. Yes. And you're being recorded. And I'm being recorded. <laughs> okay. And I guarantee it. <laughs> okay, one, one last question here. Is the business challenge of IT for IT really scale and speed? the business on scale and speed? Hmm, interesting. Um, is the business challenge of IT for IT scale and speed? The business challenge, I don't see. If we're talking about getting IT for IT more popular uh, and established, and uh, is the business challenge of IT for IT in that context, scale and speed, uh, possibly. Um, I'm, I'm struggling with the question of how I would apply that to one. an industry situation because IT for IT just happens to be what we use. You know, the architecture is irrelevant almost. It's a great thing for us to do. It's there. It's wonderful. It, uh, you don't need to scale it. You don't need to speed it up anymore. I, I love it. I'm off using it all the time. You know, it's fantastic. For IT for IT itself, do we need to scale and speed more? Uh, yes, because the industry just moves a lot faster. 
when I talked about ITIL and the lessons learned, if you look at how long we took to before ITIL became mainstream, significant period of time. You look at how many people now are viewing IT for IT already as mainstream, and it's only a year since we launched it. Absolutely, you know that's speeded up so much faster than anything else. But our world's just faster, full stop. So yes, we'll always have that challenge. Okay. Okay. I think we're out of time for for questions. But thank you both very much for your uh, contributions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.